We've already prayed part of the scripture of today. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we hear, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked way and pray, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their land. This is the second Sunday of Lent. And uh, through these, sec these Lenten Sundays, uh, we are going to be thinking about prayer. And we kind of had an overview of that thought last week. Uh, again, I don't think I'm going to be telling you anything over the next several weeks that you have never heard before. I, I really doubt that. Uh, I hope it's more about reminding us of what we already know and what we are already committed to doing and to being. Uh, what, what are some of the things that we did say last week? One of the things we said is the fact that prayer is essential. In fact, for a Christian, it's an, it's an absolute must. Uh, it's like the air we breathe. You can hold your breath for so long, but at some point you must. Thinking about prayer can raise and open doors to, to many different questions in our lives. Some of them can be functional questions. You know, what's the best way? Kneeling, standing, what's the best posture perhaps? What's the structure of prayer that I ought to be trying to follow? Uh, what do I do with what I'm absolutely conf convinced I'm in the middle of unanswered prayers? What do I do when, in, when I'm praying for someone that I know is dying? Uh, what do I do when I, when I feel led to pray, but if I'm honest with myself, I know that I am angry with God? Why do I do that? We said that so many questions about prayer are really questions about God. And uh, every once in a while, you'll hear the turn of phrase, the atheist prayer. But the truth of the matter is, if there's no God, <laughs> why, why pray? What a waste of breath. What a waste of time. Prayer is an openness, an intentional openness, in at least two ways that we talked about. One of them is an openness to God, being drawing ourselves closer to God, not trying to draw God closer to us, but drawing ourselves closer to God. Remember the rope. We're hooked onto that rock and we're pulling the ship. The rock's not getting closer to us. We're getting closer to the rock. Openness with God in that I am always, at all times, even if I'm angry, I am always honest with God. Because this openness assumes that God really does listen. And that God is impacted, affected by our prayers. So, I'll be asking over and over and over again, so what do you pray? But again, here behind that question, this other question, what do you believe what do you pray what should you pray what's a good example of prayer and of course you have known a great example of prayer you have recited a great example of prayer as we did just a few moments ago in that which we call the the lord's prayer i want to begin several weeks of just walking through pieces of it and so even though we won't be looking at the whole at once you already know the whole. You, you've known it for years. And you're on top of that. Jesus' disciples had asked him, you know, Lord, te teach us to pray. And it was a common uh, practice in the day that a, a, a teacher would have a certain prayer or a certain style of prayer. And as you listen to that teacher's disciples praying in that style, you knew which teacher it was. So, Lord, uh, teach us to pray. And in many ways, that's also a, a statement. Lord, help us sound like you. Help us uh, look like you. Help us be able to be identified with you, which is, of course, that's a great thing. You, we all need to be doing that more all the time. Now, he didn't expect that this would be the only prayer they would pray, but that it was a prayer to help teach them how to pray. This prayer would shape their thinking about prayer. Again, how wonderful is that? I think we can learn a lot about prayer from this most, at least I think, I, don't, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this most famous prayer in the Bible. Again, what we pray reflects 
what we believe about God. So what does the Lord's Prayer teach us about God? Well, we all know this prayer Jesus taught to his disciples. Can I go back and say, uh, your children should know this prayer. If you're one of the parents or one of the grandparents in the room, your children should know this prayer. Be sure and teach it to them. How will they best learn it if you teach it to them? How old were you? Stop for a moment and try to go back for some of you, mm, way back. Uh, try and go back and think, when did I first learn this prayer? This that we call the Lord's Prayer. Now, I know there are perhaps some sitting here who indeed you were raised in a home that you never, not even ever one time heard this prayer. I'm fully aware that's true in some of our lives. And so you would probably pick a time, teenage, uh, 20s, or whenever you became a part of the church. But for most of us, as kids, as, as younger people, you know, as a child, uh, I learned this prayer in, in two languages. Uh, English, of course, but I also learned it in Spanish. You know, I have long believed that Spanish is going to be the language of heaven. Of course, I have a friend who grew up in Taiwan, speaks Chinese, and he goes, just do the math, dude. Just do the math. 1.5 billion people can't be wrong. Well, who knows? But in English, we all know that the Lord's Prayer begins, Our Father, who art in heaven. In Spanish, as I grew up learning it, it was, Padre Nuestro que estás en los cielos. Padre Nuestro really means Father Our. Father Our. Just that little twist. And I think that's really a better way to say that. Not just my personal bias, but I'll tell you why. I think it is better for the emphasis to be on Father more than on Our. Uh, that helps me. I mean, it's a small thing I realize, but it helps me and I want to be part of where I want us to go today as we share for a few minutes. Let's begin with the emphasis on the word Father. Father. And I know, I know that the minute I jump into the word Father, there are some, maybe not many, but there are some who struggle with the idea of God as Father. Some struggle with it just out of uh, a sense of political correctness. And, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That, that. That's fine. Some struggle with it out of a sense of theological problems for them. And, and I'm okay with that too. What I want to address for a moment is some deal with it because there's a sense of personal experience that creates a wall. Personally, I think we have to be very careful when we try to make the Bible fit into our definitions instead of letting the Bible set our definitions when it comes to politics, when it comes to theology, when it comes, yes, even to our personal experience. My experience doesn't explain the Bible. The Bible helps explain my experience. Our definitions too often limit the reality of God, our Father. And what do I mean by that? Remember, this is not um, our father who is retired and lives down in Florida. No, it's not that far. <laughs> hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. I heard him. Okay, wait a minute. And this is not our father who sometimes lost his cool when I forgot to take out the trash or feed the dog or some other chore that was mine. You know, it's not even... It's not even our Father who faithfully sat by my sickbed or enthusiastically, sometimes embarrassingly enthusiastically yelled at my soccer games or, or that generously replaced that football that I allowed to bounce out into the street, get run over by a car and get popped. And, and no questions asked, another football the next day. It's not even the father who lovingly and patiently listened when it seemed like all my sisters, and there were five of them, were all ganged up on me. Or even the father who took the time to talk to me about life and girls and sex and money and ministry and 
No. Hear me. It is wrong to limit God by the negative definitions we might have of Father. But hear me again, it is equally limiting to define God by all the good definitions we might have. Listen to what a spiritual mentor of mine, uh, Dennis Kinlaw, once wrote on this. He wrote a book that says, uh, let's start with Jesus. And he wrote this. Naturally, we start with the word father as descriptive of a human relationship, which we want to use to help us understand God, how to relate to God, how to explain the divine being. It usually comes as a jolt to us to realize that in Christian thought, the word father first applies to the first person of the Holy Trinity and only an analogical way to human fatherhood. Father speaks of the divine reality that helps us know what the human relationship should be. Adam was not the first father. Think about that. Adam was not the first father. The fact is that the divine fatherhood is explanatory of the human fatherhood, not the human fatherhood explanatory of the divine fatherhood. Our father is so much greater our Father is so much more than more. Jesus helps us by reminding us that this is our Father who art in heaven. And He is not to be confused with all the other really great dads that are out there. N not to mention, He's definitely not to be confused with the not so great dads that are out there. But you know, it's not only the image of Father that can hinder us in our praying and in our belief regarding God. There are other images that can be real barriers or stumbling blocks to us. Let, let me mention a couple of them, extremely opposite ones, yet they are often almost simultaneously present in our lives. The first is a picture of God as, um, well here, you, you help me with this. Repeat after me. Ho. 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 Let me, let me do that again. Ho. 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 Ho, ho, ho. Have we ever given in to the fact that sometimes we think God's sort of like a big Santa Claus in the sky? That wasn't very theological, but you got it. Santa can only bring. God is like Santa Claus, only bigger for sure, which can only be a good thing. After all, Santa can only bring toys and goodies. God can only bring healing and prosperity and gifts. I fear we give into this picture too often, and I believe this is because of our misguided definition of love. You know, if you love me, you will give me what I want and you will agree with my beliefs, and you will approve of my choices, and you will never judge me if you love me. But now to the other extreme. And this can be a real stumbling block. We might call this the, uh, the top level executive image of God. You can already think of some of the dangers in this one. Uh, first, the, you know, the corporate world tells us that if we are going to succeed, we must be able to delegate, right? I mean, that just only makes sense. So someone as important as God can't really be bothered with my little needs. So maybe, you know, dispatches this angel or, or sends that person. Maybe if it is a desperate situation, but you know, not everyday stuff. Maybe in a, in a life and death matter, but not when it comes to things like, you know, jobs or choosing a college or attending, uh, you know, what college I'm going to go to, what major I'm going to choose when I get there, uh, choosing a spouse, am I even going to get married, raising my kids, you know, all those little things of life. God, yes, life and death, sure, but not these other things. So we give in to thinking we should only pray to God about major problems. You know, war and, and droughts and earthquakes and terror attacks and injustices in the world. And we should. We don't think God will be bothered 
by the turmoil in my little life, my little home. He can't be worried about how my life is shaken or, or how my spirit is dry. You know what? Another, maybe even more sinister side to this image might be when you don't perform in a big company, what happens? You're fired. You're fired. You know, in the big company, it's either perform or burn. There's a spiritual picture there, too. Some see God as a stern judge or an overly critical parent that you can never, ever really satisfy. And this can come from a misguided understanding of judgment, which I believe comes right directly out of a misguided understanding of love. We need to remember that our failure and sin is not without cost to God. The cross is the proof of God's love. God suffered greatly for us. God so loved the world, you remember that verse too, that he gave his only son. You know, all through the New Testament, and especially in Matthew, we find a loving heavenly father. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. For your father knows what you need even before you ask him. A couple chapters later, chapter 10, verse 30, we're told he knows you so much that even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Again, let me ask you, what do you believe when you pray? Our Father. Because what you believe reflects what you pray. And what you, re what you pray reveals what you believe. Let me say that again. What you believe reflects what you pray, and what you pray reveals what you believe. This is not nearly enough teaching uh, or reminding on the subject of how wonderful our God is. Our Heavenly Father is powerful. Our Heavenly God is merciful, awesome. He's also gentle, loving, kind. God calls for our total surrender and our total trust. And God is worthy to receive that total gift, the total gift of ourselves. God is worthy to receive that. But what about the, uh, the our part, as in our Father? What about that part? Have you noticed? I know that you have, but you maybe just haven't thought about it in the last five minutes. Um, Jesus did not say, my Father. He did not say, your Father. He did not look at the people who were around as the disciples were listening and say, their, their father, but he said, our father. Sometimes I think we give in to thinking something else besides our father. Because, you know, Jesus was speaking to a wonderfully diverse group of people. Now, granted, they were all Jews of that first century. No question about that. But they were still quite unique individuals. Some were fishermen. There was a tax collector thrown in there. A political activist was in there. There were some young people. There were some old people. There were some strong leaders. There were faithful followers. And he says, our father. Not your father. Not even my father. What is Jesus teaching? Our includes all who believe. It includes Jesus. His heavenly father. This is a group blessing this is a group reality. And I'm so glad, I, again, I've spent more time thinking about this probably in the last little bit. I am so glad that Jesus did not say, my father. That could have been a pretty excluding thought. Can you imagine having to stand up next to Jesus when you pray? I, I want what he, I'm, I'm taking what he has. I, I'm, I'm saying what he says. I'm hiding in his shadow. We, we are included with Jesus. And at the same time, we cannot claim soul possession of God. God is not my father. Why? Because if God was my father alone, then you and you and you and you could not be my brothers and sisters if he was only my father. Hmm. Jesus is calling us to family. We get to sit in on the family portrait. Some of you go, that is always the worst day of my life. 
But we get to sit in on the family portrait. We use words like church and body of Christ and community. Every time you pray our Father, we should be reminding ourselves of a few, of a few things. Prayer is about God first. It's not about me, it's about, or you. It's about God first. Prayer is about a community. Prayer is about a family. Prayer is about me in a community. Prayer is a solitary exercise, but it is also an exercise of the group, of the community. So, how has your praying been this past week? We kind of launched some thoughts last week. I hope it has been good. I really do. Let me remind you about using that, those four words that we kind of presented last week. The words of adoration, of confession, of thanksgiving, and of supplication. As words to kind of help guide our praying. And again, there's a reason behind the order. I need to start with my attention on God. And then I, I'll, I will get to the needs of my life. But in the meantime, I'll have made sure God knows I know who I am and what I need to deal with. God will hear, will hear me say, thank you. And then, yes, God will hear me say, oh, and by the way, uh, this, this has got to, something's got to happen here. And God is listening. So let me invite you again. Don't forget the invitation to come. Be part of prayer. Tuesdays, 1030, right there in that chapel. Just come be a part of that. God could, and I realize that that doesn't fit into nearly everybody's schedule. Uh, this evening, about 7 o'clock, there'll be a bunch of men in a circle here up near the front. Invite you to come. Come be a part. Because this is an Our Father thing. I'll ask you over and over and over, what do you pray? Always be hearing behind that question, what do you believe? Let's pray together. Lord, now we pray. We pray. Because Jesus reminded us that you are our Father. Lord, to, again, we pray that you'll speak to us through this so common yet so uniquely powerful gift we call prayer. Some of us do it well. None of us do it as well as we should. Some of us are fairly consistent. None of us are as consistent as we should be. Lord, would you remind us today that this prayer is an invitation to be part of a community. Help us, Lord, to think about that, pray about that, understand that better, maybe even before we walk out these doors as we are surrounded by this community even right now. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that are ours to be part of your community. Speak to us, we pray. We thank you that this begins as we give ourselves to Jesus. Help us even now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.